Okay, welcome to Wednesday, May 26th class session in our differential equations course. These are some of the things we're going to look at today. And, you know, the goal is to wrap up presentation of chapter one. So, think about our structure and everything, you know, you've started handing in a homework. You haven't gotten any feedback yet. I haven't posted solutions. Uh, we haven't even come to talk about exam yet. And we haven't even completed one week yet. So we've launched this horrible, tremendous machine, but we haven't gone through a cycle of how it works. After this week, then we've completed one out of six weeks. So I want to point out a couple things to you. Remember that Monday, May 31 is Memorial Day. There was no class session and no office hours. And that's noted on our website. So that's a holiday. So that means you're not going to hand in homework on Monday. Why not? Because it's a holiday and you've done no new work on Thursday. What do I mean by that? I'll say that in a second. So you're gonna hand in homeworks on Wednesday and Thursday of next week. You've handed in one homework on Tuesday, another tonight, Wednesday, another tonight, uh, next night, Thursday. And if you read through our syllabus or our welcome emails, you understand that Thursday, I'm only reserving for your questions and examples of things we've done. In other words, I can't pump you with new material every day because you wouldn't breathe and you wouldn't have a chance to get some feedback and consume some of the non-homework materials I provided. So you'll get used to our cycle, even though it'll only last six weeks. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, presentation of new material. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, submission of homework. On Thursday, no new material. I'm just going to work examples and your questions. So any of you who are either live or consuming the recording online, you can send in questions, email, whatever, you know, problems you'd like to see done on Thursday. Now, these problems won't necessarily relate to the homework, but you do have Thursday night homework hand in. So they could be related to some of the problems you'll hand in Thursday night. And those problems are now posted. So the Thursday is just kind of a space for us to catch our breath, do some examples we wish we could have done, and allow you to catch up on the things you're going to consume. We'll talk about exams later, but the plan for exams is that there's three exams in our six weeks. The exams are going to take place, I'm sorry to break this to you, over the weekend. So I'll probably have you hand in homework on Thursday night, 1159, and then at that time I'll release an exam. And that exam you'll work on over the weekend, and you'll hand in on the Monday at 11.59. So you thought you were getting a vacation over the weekend, but during the exam weekends, that's not gonna happen. So you have six weeks, three exams, so that's gonna eat three of your weekends. Exactly what is the content of the exams? You know, how many problems, what kind of problems, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about that next week because at the end of next week, you get your first exam released. So I'm slowly trying to bring you into the system here. Uh, part of the machine, part of the cycle is after you've submitted the homeworks, I'm gonna read them, return them, and post solutions. So probably sometime this afternoon or evening, I'll post solutions to the ones you just handed in yesterday. And then shortly thereafter, I'm not exactly sure, it might be Thursday, I will finish the cycle and return your homework papers to you with comments and grades. 
I will return them in the Google Drive folders that I demonstrated in our first meeting. But if you don't remember that, I'll send each one of you an email with your own personal link to a Google Drive folder. And that's where I'll dump all of your corrected papers, grade reports, exams. Instead of mailing, attaching, mailing, attaching, mailing, attaching, which isn't a very good security practice anyway. So I have not read any of your homework problems for accuracy. I just basically assembled them you know, into one electronic file that I'll read and write on electronically. I want to say a couple things about your homework problems. Just be careful, do your best. You will follow the solution uh, instructions on the website. Remember to submit one PDF file. When you're assembling a PDF file, I mean, you know, you could, you could construct your homework any way you want, Word doc, Google doc, written pages, but you can always, whatever tool you're using, make a copy of your work as a PDF. And the two simplest tools that I have seen are Apple Notes, which is basically on any iPhone product, iPad, iPhone, or Microsoft Lens. You could Google Microsoft Lens, and that's a kind of, uh, Adobe replacement. You know, on my website, I also list the Adobe Acrobat route, the Adobe Reader route, but I don't think Adobe is a excellent partner. I don't mind if you use Cam Scanner because you're not on my system. Cam Scanner historically has been a virus installation tool. So be careful about that. Uh, you, you could say I'm being a little bit harsh, but monitor your system carefully when you use some free products because you get a lot of adware, spyware delivered that way too. Of course, a lot of good products you get stuff delivered that way too, but, but uh, I don't mind that suggestion. I don't mind if you use Cam Scanner. I, I, I'm not gonna, pick on any product because the security landscape in general is just a big mess everywhere and you know that. Okay, so that so you I've only seen your first batch of homework. You you did a good job preparing it. You just have to work on uniformizing a little bit. When you take photos and you import them into a Word document or you import them into another document before you create the PDF. Remember, you can take a photo and you can import it into a Word document, but might as well make that full size on the sheet, right? Because then you're not giving me small things that are hard to read. Also, if you do photographs at all, make sure that they're in a very well lit area. So handwriting and using a PDF scanner are usually the easiest ways to do things. Photos, unless you have very nice lighting, tend to be too dark and hard to read. So I am not gonna be pushy or picky about things too much as long as I can read them. And uh, what do I want to say to that? In that sense, you know, Cam Scanner was very good because it lets you set up things as a grayscale. It lets you import or quote unquote scan things in grayscale, which made the contrast of the writing very nice. And that way, and for that reason, the products like Microsoft Lens, Apple Notes have such settings now too. So Cam Scanner uh, had value does have value in its day. You just want to be careful. Okay, so unless there's any other thing you want to ask about directly procedurally, I don't mind if you want to post any procedural questions or just how things work. Uh, then let's get into having some actual fun. So those are the things that I wrote down that I wanted to say today. 
Okay, so I'm trying to decide whether I should take another tour to my whiteboard or whether I should just launch into a example. Let's take another tour to the whiteboard. It was so popular last time. Yeah. So again, I might make some notes on the whiteboard as we go on today. If I want an image to be fixed on that board for your complete reference, but you know, we're just making a circle right here. And last time we talked about Euler's method, numerical techniques, and we talked about existence and uniqueness of solutions. And remember, this was kind of like the lawyer section. And you can look at the problem in there and decide what the meaning or purpose of that problem is. But this is a really important basis, really important foundation for us. Because without the assurance that solutions exist, we're kind of wasting our time. And also, without the assurance that solutions are unique under ordinary conditions, we're also kind of just shooting in the dark. I always use this illustration when I talk about existence and uniqueness. So we're not going to legally reproduce those theorems that we talked about last time, but what's the key takeaway for existence and uniqueness? If the slope function is nice, you can expect nice behavior. And the nice behavior you want is existence and uniqueness. And the nice property of the slope function is that it's simply continuous. If you want to wrap both conditions into one, then if partial f partial y and f are both continuous, then you have both existence and uniqueness. And I phrased it in the terms last time of paying for a service. You want this excellent quality, you have to pay. And what do you have to pay? You have to pay with the concept that these two functions are continuous. And we don't dip into Calc 3 a lot. We're going to use Calc 3 once in a while as we need it. But one of the things I want to remind you of is what does continuous mean for a function of two variables? Is this an expensive price to get this performance? And the answer is not really. Continuous is not an extremely high bar. Continuous just means what? That there's no breaks in the surface, so to speak. So my favorite illustration is to take a piece of paper this is a surface. And right now, it is a continuous surface. There are no holes or breaks pumped into the surface at all. But we can see relatively complicated functions here, really, really messy combinations of t's and y's, where f and partial f partial y will still be continuous. If I take my surface and crumble it into a ball and then take it apart carefully without tearing it. So what do you think about the surface right here? Your first reaction is this surface is an absolute mess. But you know what? It's still continuous. Unless I've poked a hole in the surface or introduced a tear someplace in the surface, Everywhere else, it's continuous, even though it's an absolute mess. Forget about the hole. Forget about the tear here for a second. What is this surface not? This surface is not differentiable. It doesn't have tangent planes at all these crazy bumps and corners. But it's perfectly continuous. So continuous is not a high bar in surface land. 
continuous is not a terribly high bar in surface land. Where these things are not defined, then you have to be careful. And that's the purpose of your homework in that section. OK, next illustration. So we had talked about, and this is going to be our first example today, exactly what we can do in a special case of an autonomous equation. So we'll open up with a famous autonomous equation as an example today. The purpose of this section of 1.6 is to feed this section 1.7 called bifurcations. So in this section, we're kind of batch solving whole piles. The fancy word is families of differential equations. Then we're going to wrap up chapter one with probably the most famous type of equation, the linear equations. And we're going to show you two techniques for solving linear equations. And then later in the course, we're going to come back and use that technique to build another new idea. So uh, what is a linear differential equation? What is an integrating factor? We'll define that for you. But I want you to be suspicious right now. You have not taken any math class, probably not since the seventh grade, where you haven't used the word linear. Linear or line? So the, the question in your mind is, what does linear really mean? What does it mean to be a linear equation? What does the concept of linear really mean? But you've thrown that word around in every math class you've ever taken. And, and most commonly, and I'm sure I'll even do this today, linear means, oh, it's like a line. But what is the property of a line that linear is like? That, that sounds like I'm talking in circles. So it's the concept of linear we're gonna use. And it's the concept of linear I wanna to bring together from basically every math class you've ever taken. Used linear in calculus with a tangent line. But you also use linear calculus when you talked about the quote unquote linearity of the derivative. So linear, linearity is a principle that lines exhibit. But you can't say something is linear because it's a line. There are a lot of things that are not lines that are linear. And so it is differential equations. And these are very powerful illustrations. So what is the purpose of linear? That's something we're going to examine in a lot of contexts. OK, I'm going to go backwards. I may come back and erase some things and fill in space if I see a good picture I want to present. But at least that's on the board to give you a view of where we're going. So let's pick on an interesting problem, but not a difficult problem, kind of a fun problem and a practical problem all at once. I'm going to look at a problem way back in section one, two. Let's look at a mixing problem. Oh, excuse me, got to get someone else in the room right here. Very good. And let me switch back to my paper. Very good. OK. So example. Here's a mixing problem. And there's lots of exciting things about mixing problems. But the first thing I want to do is finish my illustrations that I want to present from section 1.6. So I'm going to pull up a mixing problem in the book. I'm going to pull up 1, 2, 39. And it was in section 1, 2. You may have read the solutions that I posted in section 1, 2. I gave it as a sample problem. But you may not have seen you know, the deep, deep significance of mixing problems. And that's what I want to talk about now. First, let's just solve it. I will pull up a copy of the book because I don't want to rewrite the whole problem. So let me pull up a copy of the book, share it with you, and then we'll move through the problem. I'm looking at chapter one. I'm looking at section two. I'm looking at problem 39. 
and I'm going to shrink that. Then share this problem with you. So here's the problem. Let me draw your attention to it. Let me draw your attention to it while we're reading it. And an interesting problem, I'll show you how to solve all mixing problems. You have some mixing problems on your homework for the next night. And it's a technique of setting things up. But after a while, you can get blasé about mixing problems. You say like, yeah, they're just a dime a dozen. But let's look, read this together. I have a five gallon bucket, pure water. So just water, nothing else in the water. Now we start dumping salt into the bucket at a rate of one quarter of pounds per minute. So I'm shoveling salt into the bucket, not teaspoons, pounds. I, that's how this person chose to measure at this time, pounds and gallons. But we also have a spigot in the bucket at the bottom or an opening in the bucket, a faucet, and one half gallon of this mixture is leaving the bucket. It says, we add pure water to keep the bucket full. So this is gonna be a relatively easier calculation. And let's assume that during this whole process, everything is well mixed. So now listen to the question. What is the amount of the salt in the bucket after? And look at the choices, one minute, 10 minutes, 60 minutes. That sounds normal. Then you get these suspicious questions, 1,000 minutes. And then part E, the authors seem to be joking, a very, very long time. So something is up here. There's a concept here. There's a deep concept that they want you to absorb that somehow the difference between 10 minutes and a very, very long time, they're not so different as they might seem. Okay, now I'm gonna show you how to set this up. But think about the situation first. I had the bucket filled with pure water. I have a half gallon per minute leaving, but to keep the bucket full, a half gallon per minute entering. What else am I adding to the bucket? a quarter of a pound of salt per minute. So the water is going from just straight water to salty water. How can you calculate the amount of salt in the water at all those times? Because the moment you open the spigot, the first instant you open the spigot, what comes out of the spigot? Well, kind of pure water. Maybe a tiny amount of salt has worked its way through the tank but mostly pure water. But then as time goes on, you've been dumping salt into the tank. Well, salt eventually is going to be leaving the tank through that spigot as long as the thing is well mixed. Okay, let's do the problem. I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna unshare that. And I'm gonna show you how to set up this problem. And by the way, this is essentially the way you set up all mixing problems. And sometimes mixing problems have more features we got to worry about, but this is a common way of setting up mixing problems. So let's let this be my, uh, what was it now? Five gallon bucket. And the five gallon bucket is always full, but I have two things happening. I have one half gallon per minute leaving the tank. To keep the tank full, I have one half gallon per minute entering the tank. And I also have 
someone shoveling salt into the tank. At one quarter pound per minute. So how can I answer the questions? The base question was, what's the amount of salt in the tank after these times? So someone asked me, what's the amount of salt in the tank? Then I have to say, quite honestly, I don't know how much salt is in the tank at any time. Well, that's my variable then. Let's let S of T be the salt in the tank at time T. T, we're going to measure in minutes. That seems to be how they're delivering things to us. And S of T, I think we're going to measure in pounds. Because that's how they delivered it to us. So we need to find a formula for the salt. We admit that the salt in the tank is changing because I'm shoveling salt in, but I'm also possibly trickling salt out. Not very much salt leaving at the beginning, but more and more salt leaving as time goes on. So the moment I say that salt in the tank is changing, the moment I say that, then I'm talking about a differential equation. And I can examine the rate at which salt changes. So this will be the rate of change of salt with respect to time. Salt measured in pounds, time measured in minutes. Now let's think about this logically. What is the rate of change of salt with respect to time? And this is the key fact of all mixing problems, so paying attention here. There's only two ways salt could ever change in that tank. And that is, it's added or removed. That sounds too silly at first, but think about it this way. The rate of change of salt in the tank is essentially equal to the rate at which salt enters the tank minus the rate at which salt exits the tank. That's the only way salt can be in the tank, or it's the only way salt can change if it enters the tank or it exits the tank. Now keep your eye on the units, because this problem is relatively simple, but in other cases, you need to focus on the units to get everything straight. What is the rate at which salt enters the tank? Well, that was given to us straight up. Salt is entering the tank at one quarter pound per minute. I will not write pound per minute here. I'll just know that we're talking about pounds per minute. But what is the rate at which salt is leaving the tank? I know the rate at which liquid is leaving the tank, but gallons per minute is not pounds per minute. So I can't just say subtract one half. What I have to do is take the gallons per minute, essentially kill the gallons and add the pounds. So how should I do that? Well, just if you want to think about an elementary unit analysis kind of situation, I need to multiply by pounds per gallon. Because gallons per minute times pounds per gallon will be pounds per minute. But how do I write down pounds per gallon for this problem? The gallons is not bad because the tank has always got five gallons in it. So I know that the tank's volume is always five gallons. Later, you'll try problems where the volume of the tank changes. You know, the amount of solution in the tank changes. But now, what about the pounds of salt in the tank at time T? Well, I don't know that. That was what I set up as my variable. So all I can do is write S of T here. S of T pounds every moment T in a five gallon bucket. Now, when I multiply these two things, I have one half gallon per minute times S of T over five pounds per gallon. That gives me one tenth times S of T with the correct units, pounds per minute. 
Okay, so I spent time setting that up because this is a key, key issue, setting up a mixing problem. All mixing problems are set up in a way by some variation of rate in, rate out, in minus out. But the expressions here might be more complicated when the situation is more complicated. Now this is a differential equation, surely. And now I say, I need an initial condition to solve the differential equation. Let's let, how much salt was in the tank at time zero? Well, we were told that. We were told that the tank initially had pure water in it, no salt. So now I have a differential equation. I have initial value. I have initial value problem. This fits in section 1.2 because it's a separable equation. But why am I mentioning it now? Because it also fits in section 1.6. It is an autonomous equation. Autonomous, I had to learn how to spell. In other words, the slope does not depend on time. So now we're gonna solve this equation, but I'm gonna show you a new way to solve this equation. I'm gonna show you a handier way to solve this equation. We could separate variables. Let me make sure I got the problem here in front of you too. Now that is, because it is separable, that is, let me rewrite this and combine the fractions on the right-hand side. Let's say ds dt, and let's go for common denominator of 20 here, five over 20, two over 20. So this could be five minus two s over 20. And then this could be separated as ds is five minus two s and one over 20 is dt times dt. The reason I'm not going to do it this way is because I want to show you a very funny shortcut. But you know what I would do next right here. I would integrate both sides. I have the natural logarithm. I have absolute value. Some of you have been paying attention, asking me questions about when and where I eliminate, how I eliminate absolute value signs in the problems. Yeah, that's an issue. But I'm gonna do it without any integration and without referring to absolute value. So I'm gonna use this powerful word, linear. Because in fact, this problem is also from section 1.8 and 1.9. This is also a linear equation. I haven't defined a linear equation yet, so you're gonna ask me why is it a linear equation? So right now I'll say, well, it's a linear equation because it looks like a line. That's a terrible, terrible answer. I'll, we'll define linear in a few moments when we get into section 1.8. But I can show you a very cool property that you'll recognize as linear that you can use right here. So first of all, a reminder. What happens if I give you a differential equation, dq dt equals minus three q and q of zero is seven. That's a separable equation. It's the most valuable problem in all of ordinary differential equations. It's the MVP of ODEs. By now you have watched that video. If you haven't, you've really lost out. You need to know that video entirely because you need to look at this equation and just instantly write down the answer. No separating, no screwing around. Seven e to the minus three t. Now let's use our knowledge of existence and uniqueness to justify why I'm allowed to do this. Essentially, I'm allowed to do this because it works. Let's try it out. What's the derivative of seven e to the minus three t? Minus three come down, minus three times seven e to the minus three t. But what's minus three times seven e to the minus three t? 
it's minus three times seven e to the minus three t. So this function clearly satisfies the differential equation. This function clearly put in t equals zero satisfies the initial condition. So this is clearly a solution to this problem. It, it's kind of offensive if I keep saying clearly. I'm, I'm not trying to insult or anything. I'm just saying you have to think about it, then you have to accept that it's a solution. But what else do you have to accept? Look at this function over here. A very continuous function and it's derivative with respect to Q. Remember the dependent variable here is Q is minus three, again, continuous. This is the nicest of all functions. So since this function is nice, I'm guaranteed existence and uniqueness. Now watch how we do this through the back door. If this is an example of an answer and this problem has one and only one answer, what does that mean? This is the one and only one answer to that problem. That's the power of the existence and uniqueness theorem. That's a little too slick, but that's why we need the existence and uniqueness theorem in general. So now you're saying, well, but so what? How do you apply that to this problem? How do you apply that to ds dt is equal to, allow me to rearrange it, minus one tenth s plus one quarter and s of zero is zero. Well, I do this by doing a linear substitution. What if I let q be minus one tenth s plus one quarter? Tell me what dq dt is. If Q is minus one tenth S plus one quarter, sorry, got to slip up the paper there. Then DQ DT means you differentiate this right hand side with respect to T. Now S is a function of T. So this is minus one tenth the S DT. And this is derivative of one quarter zero. That's just minus one tenth the SDT. So DQ DT is minus one tenth the SDT. But now look at the payoff. The SDT is minus one tenth S plus a quarter. So this is minus one tenth. Fill in the SDT right here. Minus one tenth S plus quarter. But that is minus one tenth Q. This is a linear substitution I'm making. Linear substitutions. If you think backwards through all the fog, that was one of the first substitutions you learned in calculus when you're doing integrals. So now I have a problem that says what? DQ DT is minus one tenth Q. This problem just says dQ dt is minus one tenth Q. And then I know the answer instantly. Now I need to know the initial condition, right? So what's Q of zero? Well, S of zero is zero. So Q at zero will be minus one tenth times zero plus a quarter. So Q of zero is one quarter. Well, now I know the answer to this problem. Q of T is one quarter E to the minus one tenth T. Now you say you weren't solving for Q, you were solving for S. That's right, I am solving for S. So now that I know what Q is, let's go back and find out what S is. So now I say minus one tenth S plus quarter is one quarter e to the minus one tenth T. 
when I'm doing this linear substitution here, I actually am doing it slow and every step, one step at a time. We could do it much faster, but first you got to see it and get used to it. Yeah, so keep prompting me if I don't move the paper up. Thank you. So now I'm going to solve this for S by subtracting a quarter from both sides. I don't need to show every step here, but I'll just show you the steps so that you're more comfortable with it. You could fill in the steps. And now multiplying both sides by negative 10. Here's S of T. Multiply by negative 10, this becomes five halves. This becomes minus five halves. E to the minus one tenth T. I think I shouldn't repeat myself. So why don't I just write five halves, one minus e to the minus one tenth t. Now, not only have we solved the problem and we can now answer all the questions, but there's a lot of beauty in this solution, visual beauty and calculational beauty. So let me rewrite it up here so we could do the answering of his actual question. It was five halves, one minus, and then show you how it connects to section 1.6. E to the minus one tenth T. Let's think about this before we pull out a machine and draw it. Decaying exponential, subtract decaying exponential. In other words, you know what E to the minus one tenth T looks like and E to the minus one tenth t would be looking like, you know, something decaying like that. I don't have any scale here, right? But this would be e to the minus one tenth t qualitatively. So what happens is this decays to zero. Well, this becomes one. So what happens as time goes to infinity? S of t must approach five halves, pounds. And that's the answer to his question backwards. What happens after a very, very long time? Well, the salt in the tank will stabilize at two and a half pounds. Now, let's think about how beautiful that is first. But by the way, uh, let's put a thousand in there. Now a thousand in for T, let's answer his questions backwards, would be E to the minus one tenth times a thousand, E to the minus 100. Again, that is probably so close to zero that I can't tell the difference. It'll still be five halves, approximately. If you wanna pop that into your calculating machine, you go right ahead. But I certainly believe that this is very close, approximately equal to five halves pounds. What happens after one minute, 10 minutes, 60 minutes? Let's think about this visually. So first I'm gonna mark five halves. One, two, three, there's my five halves. This will be the salt in the tank at any time. And then here, this will be my time scale. I know that after a very, very long time, the salt in the tank is gonna level off at five halves. How is it gonna level off? Let's think qualitatively. Now. I could plug in the numbers here and get actual numbers, but all I'm doing is having a one minus decaying exponential. And I started, by the way, you acknowledge that my initial condition was zero. So I'm saying I'm gonna predict that the equation looks like this. That's the curve that's the salt in that tank at any time. Now I might pull up Mathematica or I might pull up Desmos to plop that curve, but I think you could pop that curve out easily. And even better, what if I had started with three pounds of salt in the tank instead of zero? Well, again, even if I start with three pounds of salt in the tank, you could rework the whole problem, but all you're going to get is the salt to drain off and stabilize at two and a half pounds. Why do I stabilize at two and a half pounds? Because S of T equals five halves is what? 
an equilibrium solution. This is how we relate to one six. An equilibrium solution to the initial value problem. I'm spending a good deal of time on this because this problem is very valuable. And I'll show you even more value in a second. Let's go back to the original problem and see why that's an equilibrium solution. I'm gonna go back to the original problem as I wrote it up here in the corner. S equals five halves. What do you see from this fraction? That if S equals five halves, the right-hand side is zero. And if S equals five halves, the left-hand side is zero. So this five halves pounds of salt, this constant function for all T, S of T equals five halves pounds, actually satisfies the differential equation by existence and uniqueness then. It is the one and only one solution, this differential equation that does what? Goes through five halves pounds. Now you could say, well, how do I know things are decaying there? Well, I see the decay right here. I'd have to work out another solution for the blue solution before I see it decaying above. Or I could look at a slope field. Let's pull in a slope field in a second because I want to do another demo of maple. But tell me before I pull up the demo of maple, and you, this is what I mean. Like if we were in a classroom, I would actually solicit and you would tell me, why is this not a silly, foolish problem? And that is because this idea is so powerful. People make billions of dollars with this idea people that live near you and I. Well, look, Corey, I can't say that because not all of you are living where I'm living right now. I'm living in Midland, Michigan. Who is it in Midland, Michigan that makes billions and billions of dollars with this idea? It is the Dow Chemical Company. And you say, well, wait a minute, Dave, this is, that's too easy or else I'd be making billions, billions of dollars. Well, you might, you, you maybe you should be. Here's the concept. Let's think about the local Coca-Cola bottling plant. You have bought a Coca-Cola bottling plant, and that means you got the right to mix up Coca-Cola, right? And then you deliver it, you're a supplier of Coca-Cola to the local restaurants and places, right? You can drive by Coca-Cola bottling plants. I mean, there's one in this area somewhere, I forgot where. Do you think every time someone orders a batch of Coca-Cola, they just get out a big bowl? and say, okay, let's mix some Coca-Cola. I need this much sugar, I need this much water, I need this much brown stuff. No, because every batch would be different in a way, subtly different. You gotta have quality control, right? Where's the quality control? Quality control is right here. If I set up this vat and I keep dropping the right amount of salt or sugar or alcohol or whatever it is I wanna mix up, into that vat, then over time, I have super control of the consistency of that solution in the vat. That is awesome. And in fact, why was the Dow Chemical Company so crazily successful? Because in Midland, Michigan, they found a ready supply of brine solution, right? that they could control the quality of and that helped them in the manufacturing processes. Now, that's not all. Let's think about this. What else could be mixing? And we're gonna do several examples of this. How about, let's talk about a problem where I mix things in several vats, right? I could have a vat here and a vat here and this empties into that vat and then there's another tank over here. And I got stuff entering into that vat from that tank. And then the result comes out the door and goes that way. What did I just draw a picture of? I just drew a picture of your internal organs. 
let's think about this. Drug delivery, the concentration of a medication in your body is a mixing problem. You, the doctor says, I need you to take this medication. Is it aspirin? Is it high blood pressure medication? Is it cholesterol medication? I don't know what it is, but you have several tanks in your body, the liver, the stomach, the intestines, the spleen. Eventually it leaves your body, right? And what's the doctor's goal? She has to keep a certain concentration of that medicine in your system. She says, well, for this treatment to be effective, uh, we need the concentration of this chemical in your bloodstream to be between here and here regularly, right? So what do you do? You regularly take this medication. And that keeps the supply of that chemical relatively constant in your body, does whatever it's supposed to do. I'm not a doctor. But do you understand that you know, it's going to go through several systems in your body? And sometimes you want the concentration of the chemical to be constant in your liver. And sometimes you want it to be throughout your bloodstream. And sometimes you want it to be in your stomach. That's the part where I'm not good at this because I'm not a doctor. But they have to think about this. Someone has to think about it. These pharmaceutical companies have to think about it as a mixing problem. Okay, one more super cool preview before we do the graphics on this and move on. Let's talk about the coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Let's talk about the coronavirus pandemic and what we will discuss in chapter two as the SIR model of infectious diseases. I don't know how to spell. <laughs> it's actually, I can't spell and talk at the same time. <coughs> SIR model, famous model of infectious diseases, is the common way people have examined this. And when this pandemic hit, you, in the very in early part, March last year, do you know I was so excited? Because every time I turned on the radio, they were interviewing a mathematician. How's this going to spread, Dr. Ruff Ruff? And, and then how's this going to spread in the population? What are the new variants? What's the statistics behind this? It's like all of a sudden mathematicians were valued. But let's think of the model of an infectious disease spreading as a mixing problem. We have the susceptible people. We have the infected people. I didn't need to add the word people. We have the recovered people. And the susceptible and the infected and the recovered people are like tanks. There's a susceptible tank. There's the infected tank. There's the recovered tank. And people move from being susceptible to be infected at a certain rate. If it's really, really contagious, they become susceptible, become infected quickly. Infected go through, let's take something benign like the common cold and become recovered after a certain number of days or maybe recovered by a medication, but unfortunately not for the cold or maybe recovered by some other means. Don't say vaccination, we'll talk about that later. But do you see these model of infectious disease is like three buckets and we have to trace the rate of change between the buckets. This is a mixing problem. So I would be overdoing it if I said everything in the universe was a mixing problem. Uh, your retirement account, you're trying to save for retirement? You should be. Your retirement account is a mixing problem. We could show you why. I've posted the solutions in section 1.8 that you can look at. Okay, 
So now let's go to some graphics. I wanna actually do some graphics for this so that you believe the things I said about this picture. But the real reason I wanna do this example is gonna set up everything. It's even setting up one eight and one nine for me today. Mixing problems are big, big, big. And that's how the Dell Dow Chemical Company, DuPont Chemical Company, AstraZeneca, that's how they make money, is understanding how things mix. Don't overlook that. I'm gonna open up a raw Mathematica notebook and see if we can show you how this graphics would look like. I'm not gonna open up one of my pre-planned notebooks, right? I want to just show you how things work. So I'm going to share this mathematical notebook with you, blah, 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 blah. And let's put in a couple of things. Let's put in the function, excuse me, f of t and y. And separated by commas. Let me blow this up so you can see it better. And let me bring it down. I'm not yet sure that I'm sharing this with you. Well, this is interesting. So the problem is I've got some other, this is I'm trying to define f of t and y here. I've got some other variables defined in the system. So what I'm going to do is reset that variable f of ty to be what? In fact, why don't we say s? Because we were talking about salt and tank, right? S is one quarter minus one tenth s. Independent of time. Okay, now I got f of t comma s, excuse me. I ask Mathematica what f t comma s is and Mathematica, you know, that's not what I want. Okay, reset. Yes, now it's one quarter minus one tenth s. Now let's set up the vector field for this. Vector plot. And let's do uh, this vector field, t comma y. This is already pre-given to you in my notebooks, but I wanted to do this one from scratch just for effect. Let's set it up for how many seconds? We can always adjust this. So let's say t is from 0 to 10. Let's see if we get any interesting output about this. It wants another argument, so I must be removing something, I must be missing something. My best guess is I need to also specify the Y values because I'm asking it to evaluate Y values. So let's send, oh, and I wanted to call this S. So let's call this S. That's flexibility of naming things in Mathematica. Okay, zero to 10, zero to 10, not good. I don't think a window, but I'll put a comma between them. Let's look at it. Okay, here's a vector field, mm, not very interesting. How about, they want us to go to a thousand minutes, right? Let's go to a thousand minutes. Okay, a little bit too crazy and busy. Let's just go to a hundred minutes. Okay, uh, do you see action around here about 2.5? I think 10 is way too high. Let's set this up as four. Oh, now I'm starting to see what I expected to see in that vector field. So let's call this field. And let's put in some solutions. And plot that function that we thought was the answer. Five halves times one minus e to the power, that's the exponential function, minus one tenth t. Remember all functions in Mathematica are, excuse me, defined with capital, 
commands and everything is delimited by brackets. It's angry at me for the space right here because I haven't closed the braces. Now, what else is it angry at me for? Let's find out. Say, let's run this from t equals zero to 100. t comma zero comma 100. And it doesn't like that. See, it's saying you got your all braces all messed up. So I need another brace in there. Okay, so now I define plot and solutions. I don't think I should be seeing that error message. Let's try that. So now let's show you, show, capital show, solutions and field. There's that curve going up to two and a half. Let's get a plot range here of, I'm just decorating right now. And let's say zero to a hundred. And let's say zero to four. I am spending time on this so that you can see a little mathematic action. So you can see what's going on here. I must have left out a brace. There we go. There's that curve starting at zero, zero. Now my, you know, where is this zero, zero? I don't see this nicely shown here, right? So zero, zero must be way down in here. So I think I'm gonna add something like axes. I want it to show me the axes equals true. Let's see if that makes it easier to read. It's not showing me something better that way. So I don't like that, but I see that solution climbing up to there. Uh, I'm gonna do one more thing. I'm gonna say arrowheads. Not an option for vector plot. Okay, I'm gonna go open up one of my regular worksheets. But here I'm just giving you a raw, let's graph a field, let's graph a solution. Let me open up and share another notebook with you, the slope fields and solutions notebook to show you more power of Mathematica. Slope fields and solutions. So this is on our website. Let me make a copy of it so I don't destroy my original. It's gonna be the fourth copy. And let me share this with you. Okay, and then we got to take a break because I went way over time here. Sorry about that. So I can define a problem in Mathematica. Let's define this one fourth minus one tenth times y. Now I can use s or y, but this sheet has y's built into it. Let's use the y's. Let's put S of zero equals zero in there. And now look at some of the automatic stuff I baked for you right here. I can define this equation in Mathematica's language. Y prime equals F of TY because I just defined F of TY above and I just defined the initial condition. And then I can ask Mathematica to solve it both explicitly with the desolve command and numerically with the nDesolve command. So I define an equation for Mathematica after I've defined the function. Then I say, Mathematica, solve that equation on this interval. Let's see what happens. First of all, Mathematica solves the equation. It gives us the literal answer we calculated but it also gives us a numerical answer, not with the Euler's method necessarily, but with another numerical product. Well, now let's graph this numerical solution and the field together. Okay, kind of what I was looking for, but way, way bad scale. So let's go and investigate and change some scale here. I want this time to go on for several minutes, maybe, 100 minutes. 
and six, that'll be changed to 100. The Y could be changed to five, doesn't need to be up here at six. Let's see what it looks like now. Okay, this is not good. Here's a numerical solution from Mathematica and it choked. The concentration of salt is going through the roof. No, 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 forget about that. So what caused that error? It's not even following its own slope field. Let's go back to numerical solution, an explicit solution. Do you see I only told Mathematica to build a solution from minus five to 10. So after it passed 10, it started wandering off on its own. It even was bad right here around 20. Let's change this to 100. Hopefully that doesn't overtax the machine. There we go, that's the explanation I wanted. Now, remember I said, what if I released four? What if the concentration, what if the amount of salt was already four pounds in that tank and I said it would decay to five halves? Let's change the concentration of that sink to four. Let's make the initial value four. Run through the worksheet again, have Mathematica do all the work of solving the equations. Here's the new solution. Here's the graphics. Now I think I do have the correct interpretation of this problem, this mixing problem. Okay, that is time consuming, but it set the stage for everything I want to do today. And it gave you a little bit more Mathematica practice. Remember, if you're dealing with Mathematic worksheets and it's choking or not working, send me a copy of your worksheet. The machine is not perfect, first of all. But second of all, maybe you just most likely forgot a brace or a comma, as I've done several times in front of you. Okay, what I'm going to do now, this is too much time after this mathematic example. Let's take five because we need a break. And let's come back at 115. And that's actually taking four, sorry. I'll stop sharing. I'll mute my microphone, stretch my legs for a second, and then.
Okay, and we're back. So, sorry for the time consuming things we did there, but mixing problems are really, really critical. So, I wanted you to have some physical interpretation of them. Now let's move on and work on the things you need to finish chapter one. We're on a hard pace right now. In fact, you can murderous pace in a way. That's well, not a good adjective. Remember I said we have to push a lot of things here in the beginning into the warm up, and I put a lot of things on your back consuming a lot of material during the warm up here in chapter one and two. And then we'll be able to be at a more relaxed pace. So we're gonna use our Thursdays for that purpose. If we have to catch up on something, that's true, but that's not my intention of what Thursday should be. But let me show you again, why this problem was important. Now let's look at the version of this problem again, five minus two S over 20. S of zero equals zero. You have seen, this is where we left off last time. You've seen the slope field for this problem. You've seen that at five halves, I'm just gonna make a mark and call it five halves, that there's no slope, that that's an equilibrium solution. By the way, this is a kind of a curse I have in my writing. Sorry, I'll move the paper up. It's very hard not to make fives look like S's. So if you're unsure at any moment, just ask me, but this says five minus two S. I could put little hats and shoes on my S's, but that's time consuming too. So if you're not sure whether I wrote a five or an S, let me know. And you saw the slope field for this was kind of like gradual as I approach that line and physically sharper below or above. I don't spend a lot of time drawing slope fields because I let the machines draw them for me. So this is not a very good drawing of a slope field, I'll admit but it shows you the solutions being sucked into that equilibrium solution. But remember, this is an autonomous equation and autonomous equations are special because why did we say this yesterday? Every vertical translation of a solution is a solution. No matter where I start the salt in that tank, it's gonna follow that same pattern. The slope field is constant on any horizontal line. If that's the case though, I wasted a lot of effort in drawing this slope field because if the slope is constant on any horizontal line, I didn't learn anything when I made these six different strokes with all the same slope, right? Let's do what we said we'd do last time. Take this graph and smash it. Totally collapse the T axis and make this a single vertical S axis on which we can record all the information of the problem. The first information we record is that at S equals five halves, I have an equilibrium solution. That's the dot. The next thing I record is where I don't have equilibrium solutions, I must be moving. What about below that dot? Apparently I'm moving up. Above that dot, I'm moving down. 
And remember last time we ended by saying, this is what we call a phase line. Now we attached vocabulary to this, this phase line, this equilibrium point that absorbs solutions on both sides. This is from physics, we borrow this word sink, like sink of electric field, magnetic field. Gravitational field, water field, you know, literally the sink in your basin, in your bathroom. Water goes down, it doesn't come out. So I want you to understand that this phase line totally represents this slope field. It doesn't represent the strength of the slopes, but it does represent that in this region, all slopes go up. In this region, all slopes go down. So you could say I've lost a little information, but I have the key information. What was the absolute key information as far as I was concerned in the mixing problem? That that tank would stabilize at five halves, pounds of salt. <clears throat> and we're able to do this because in this sense, this autonomous equation, no T in the slope, then this T axis is redundant, in some ways redundant. Now let's see if I can pump up the value of a phase line. <clears throat> So I'm going to take a problem out of 1, 7. So this is the purpose of phase lines. And it's called bifurcation. Let's look at a simple problem in 1, 7. I'm not going to pull it up in front of the book, uh, from the book in front of you. I'll just say, let's look at section 1.7, problem number 4. You can look that up in your book later. I have uh, dy dt is y cubed plus alpha y squared. That's a Greek letter alpha, lowercase alpha, first letter in the Greek alphabet, y squared. Uh, this is a first order, ordinary differential equation. You know, all my vocabulary, right? First order, ordinary, not partial. We don't do partial differential equations here. Uh, it is autonomous. So pop this into Mathematica, draw yourself a slope field, pop it into any application you're using, draw yourself a slope field. This does not depend on time. But it does probably depend on this parameter alpha. Like we used carrying capacity as a parameter in a previous problem, like we used growth rate as a parameter, positive or negative. Do you see what I have here is not one differential equation. I have a family. of differential equations. I have many, many, many differential equations. And be, being greedy, being naturally greedy, I'd like to solve them. I'd like to solve them all. Now solving them all might be a lot of work and calculation, right? But remember, I've got these other techniques. What about describing their quality. What about describing their quality? Well, let's take some shots at this. Depending on alpha, when alpha changes, I bet the quality of this problem changes. Let's try alpha equals zero. Then this function, now remember this is a function of y only, no t, and this function f of y is what? Well, if alpha is zero, it becomes very cheap. F of y is y cubed. You know what that looks like? The cubic function. This is the function f of y. 
f as a function of y, y cubed is a function of y. It's a very raw drawing of it, I admit. What's the phase line for that? What's the phase line for the autonomous differential equation dy dt is y cubed? Well, it depends on the slopes. And here it says slopes are negative. F of y is negative means the slope is negative. Now you say, oh, the slope of that curve is positive. I didn't say the slope of the curve. I said the value of f of y, which is the slope of my differential equation. So I have negative values of f on the left, positive values of f on the right, and a zero value of f in the middle. That gives me a phase line. Now, to the right means above zero. To the left means below y equals zero. So there's the phase line for alpha equals zero. But is that the only way this system behaves? Well, let's think about it. Let's just try another one. What if alpha was one? Well, then the differential equation, slope function, is y cubed plus y squared. Or you could write that as y squared times y minus one. Now, when is this function equal to zero? At two places, the equilibrium solutions are y equals zero and y equals one. That's a different phase line, y equals zero. This was y equals zero here too. I don't have to label that, but I'll try to keep them consistent for a while. y equals one, higher. What does this graph look like? A Little bit like this one, but cubic in this way. Zero, one. Ah, I gotta tell the difference between that square and that just crossing place. The square there means I am going up just to kiss the axis at zero and then cross at one. And that's really important because then I have negative values of f below zero, negative values of f between zero and one, and positive values of the slope after one. Now, what, what is this? This is a source at zero, emanating solutions on both sides source. Here's emanating solutions on both sides source. Here's solutions coming into the equilibrium and leaving the equilibrium on the other side. That's a node. Let's try alpha equals minus one. Well, you play this game for a while, you get used to it. Then you're gonna say y cubed minus y squared. You're gonna say y times, sorry, y squared times y minus one. You're gonna have crossing, oh, sorry. I should have put a plus one there. This is actually the minus one, and this is the plus one right here. So I got those backwards, which is dangerous and unfortunate. So yeah, this is not this is badly drawn. So I'm gonna have to come up with another drawing in a second. But this will be alpha equals plus one. A plus sign there gives me a plus sign here, gives me a solution of zero and minus one. Sorry if I wasn't paying attention to that. And here, the minus one gives me a solution and the minus one graph would look like this, crossing at minus one, kissing at the origin. This graph would look like kissing at the origin, crossing at one. Both graphs go up above eventually. So this is y equals one, this is y equals zero, this is y equals minus one. And what does this graph look like? Negative, positive, positive, negative below minus one, positive, positive after. But let's think about these alphas one and minus one that I've got reversed. So, I write this down, fix the reversed alphas. I'll do that in a second. Did it matter whether I chose one or two or five here? Did it matter whether I chose minus one or minus one half or minus four? 
Now, this would have factored the same way in either case. And these points would have been farther apart spread. But the behavior would be the same. Now, let's do some connecting right here. See, constantly I have y equals 0 as equilibrium point. That is an equilibrium point no matter what phase line I draw. And then I have this source, this source, this source. As time goes on, this graph morphs into this graph, morphs into this graph. I'll show that to you in Desmos. But it creates a connection between these equilibrium points. And look what I did on the drawing. I'm going to redraw this with the correct alphas in a second. But what I have is a bunch of phase lines that always go down, up, up. Down, up, up. But at this special moment, alpha equals 0, I don't have a down, up, up region. I just have a down and up region. The moment after I cross that, I have down, down, up. Every alpha I pick, no matter how large or how small, above zero, down, down, up. If I extend this, down, down, up. What I've done right here is create what people call a bifurcation diagram. What does bifurcation mean in English? What is bifurcation? Bifurcation is a moment of substantial change or radical change. Where the behavior went from one station to this station. For all the alphas that are less than zero, I've got this behavior over here. An equilibrium point at zero an equilibrium point at a positive value, and then downness, downness, upness in the slopes of the equation. At alpha equals zero, it's like these two equilibrium points got swallowed together and only became one with a region of downness and upness on either side. But if alpha is positive, then I got this pictures, another equilibrium point to appear below zero. And then I had a region of downness, a region of upness, and a region of upness. And the moment of change between alpha less than zero and alpha greater than zero, alpha equals zero, that's called a bifurcation value. Sorry, I was fixing the diagram. I'm not paying attention to my paper. That's called a bifurcation value. It's a moment when the behavior changed from three regions, down, down, up, to three regions, down, up, up. That middle region, do you see, kind of winked out of existence at alpha equals zero and came back upside down on the other side. The bifurcation value is the moment of significant change. Now, I haven't solved any differential equation yet, right? But I could take any one of these phase lines and produce a slope field. Let's take the phase line over here on the right, down, down, up. If I expand the t-axis, then I have at zero an equilibrium. I have a positive number in equilibrium. And between those two, I have downness, upness, and downness. If you drew the slope field for that function, if you put that function into machine, drew a slope field for that function, you'd come up with solutions that look like this. So what I've done here is not solve differential equations, but talked about the qualities of a family of differential equations.
I will watch my paper. Thanks for the reminder. And maybe you're unhappy because I haven't produced actual physical formulas and solutions. But on the other hand, if I know what things look like on this side of the zero, and I know that things look like on this side of the zero, here would be a region of equilibrium solution, equilibrium solution, downness, upness, upness. You see the difference between those two drawings. Each has three regions filled with repeating solutions that are horizontal translations, by the way, right? Each has repeating solutions in three bands. And this middle squeezed band produces these logistic curves. These unbounded bands just produce growth or decay. But the quality of these bands is different. The two bands on the outside are going up or going down, but the band in the middle is reversed, depending on whether you're dealing with a negative alpha or a positive alpha. So I have not solved these 10 billion differential equations, but I have described a key property of them. That's what someone means when they say bifurcation. Okay, I want to move on to show you something else here in the next section and to cover as much as we can. I'm going to go back to our mixing problem in a second as well. It's time for me to tell you what a linear equation is. A linear differential equation. So we've had special equations, right? Here's the general differential equation. Any messed up combination of t's and y's that I please. Here's a separable differential equation. I can separate by multiplication the t's and the y's possibly. Here's a autonomous differential equation. The slope only depends on y. By the way, I could have a slope that only depends on t as well. This is called an integral differential equation, autonomous. separable and general. And you can look at the slope field section 1.3 and they describe what happens if you have no t, what happens if you have no y. Integral equation, I call it integral because that's what you did in calculus. You always looked at derivatives and then try to find out what the original y is by integrating, right? But what's the superpower of the integral equation? Well, remember autonomous equations, the slope field is constant on horizontal lines and every horizontal translation of a solution is a solution. An integral equation, you saw this in calculus, the slope field is constant on vertical lines and every vertical translation of a solution is a solution. That's what you got when you integrated the function and you had to add plus C, plus C on the outside. So these are categories that you've seen so far in the book. These two in section 1.3, this one in section 1.2, this one in the general introduction. But now I'm gonna do a new type. Let's say dy dt is 
some function of t times y plus another function of t. Now this looks complicated, more complicated than any of the other ones above. Actually, it's more specific. This is a linear equation. This is a linear differential equation. I want to use all my adjectives. It's first order, ordinary, linear, and non-homogeneous. Here's a big new word. What does non-homogeneous mean? What does homogeneous mean? If you don't have a B of T on the end, it's called homogeneous. And the reason why is look at it from the perspective of the Y's. Here, you're saying you add up the Y's and their derivatives, EY DT minus A of TY, and the sum of all the y's and derivatives add up to zero. And that's homogeneous. They are of a same kind. They zero out. There's no net force in a static equilibrium diagram in physics. Excuse me. Here, if you bring together all the y's and their derivatives, you have this leftover function, this b of t. They don't all add up to evenness, zeroness. They don't all zero out. This is a leftover force or a leftover quantity. Homogeneous equals zero. Non-homogeneous, some function of t left over. Now you say, you call this linear equation. Oh, I see why he called it a linear equation because it reminds me of what I used to write when I wrote lines. Well, it does in a way remind you of a line, you know, something times y plus something, but it's not a line in that sense because a line is an algebraic equation. This is a differential equation. The linear here refers to the fact that y shows up in a very special way. Remember, Let's go through the list. I could have any old y I please here, any kind of messed up combinations of y's I please. Here I can have any crazy formula involving y, but it's gotta be separated from the crazy formulas or combinations of t. Here I can only have y on the right hand side, but it could be in some very mixed up formula. y cubed, secant y, tangent y, square root of y seventh divided by e to the y, crazy. Here there's no y's. What's special about this equation? There's exactly one power of y and no other occurrences of y. The y just shows up in the first power and that's what the word linear refers to. I am not dividing by y. There's no divide by y in the first power. There's no sine of y. There's no e to the y. I'm not doing anything to the y, but writing it as that equation. And because of that property, because of the simplified presence of y, These equations are very accessible. We can build relatively painless, relatively simple, relatively cheap, relatively easy analytic solutions.
Let me give you a very basic example. It'll set you on your path to your first homework or to one of your homework problems, the second homework problem due Thursday night. And then we can pick up more later. Let's write a linear differential equation. Let's say dy dt is uh, 3y plus 2 times e to the t. Put a little spice in here. Now, legally, this is linear because it's like saying the a of t is 3 and the b of t is 2 times e to the t. And this is linear y because the y only shows up one time to the first power in a very simple presentation. Let's do initial condition here like uh, minus 1. Let's pick some mellow constants. How can I solve this equation? What is it about linear that makes this accessible? Well, let's look at this equation in two pieces. The homogeneous piece or the homogeneous presentation, the homogeneous version and the non-homogeneous version. In other words, with and without this 2e to the t. If I didn't have the 2e to the t, if I just had a homogeneous problem, it would look like this. dy dt equals 3y. Now that is my friend. That's my favorite differential equation. It's the most valuable problem in ordinary differential equations. It's just exponential growth. I know how to knock that out immediately. The question is, what happens if I add this 2e to the t? Now, let me add it in a certain way. Since I want to examine it all by itself, I'm going to bring the 3y in this writing to the left-hand side so I can isolate the 2et and look at it. So here's the procedure for solving this initial value problem. First, solve for the general solution to the homogeneous problem, to star. I can do that immediately. Y of t equals now remember, I don't have a constant here, right? This constant belongs to this problem. This constant does not belong to that problem. So I need a constant here like C e to the three t. If I had a constant for star, then I could find out what the C is, but I'm not ready to find out what the C is. This is the general solution to star. To keep them straight, homogeneous and non-homogeneous, I'm going to put a little h here for homogeneous. Step two, find any, any one solution to double star. This other solution is called the particular solution. Excuse me. I need to move up and down if I get the paper off the pad. Uh, it's, it's denoted by YP, P for particular. What do I mean by any one particular solution? I'd like to find one sample solution to double star and then together the combination of yh of t plus yp of t, the linearity of the problem guarantees that this is the general solution 
to double star, the general solution to our problem. I left out an important point. I left out how to find the particular solution. How do I do that? Well, let's use some common sense. And the author playfully calls this at the beginning, let's guess. Guess, guess is not a method. Well, let's think about it. Why P could, you know, I gotta say, what could I plug in here for Y and get out two E to the T? Let's do it the opposite way. What certainly wouldn't work? Let's plug in sine T. No, oh, that's ridiculous because the derivative of sine t is cosine t minus three sine t's. Cosine t minus three sine t's is not two e to the t. Let's plug in t squared minus four. No, the derivative of t squared minus four is two t. Then subtract three copies of t squared minus four. Two t minus three times t squared minus four will never be two times e to the t. You start to understand we're not guessing. We're trying to find out what can I put into the left side to give birth to the right side. Now you say, what about e to the 7t? Where did he get the 7? Well, I'm joking in a sense because it's doomed to failure. But what's the derivative of e to the 7t? 7e to the 7t. What's three copies of 7 of e to the 7t? That's 7e to the 7t minus 3e to the 7t. That's 4e to the 7t. Now it failed. I didn't give birth to 2e to the t. I did fail. Failure. But I got an idea in the failure. Maybe the seven was the problem. Yes, how could I put in e to the 7t and expect to give birth to e to the t? Well, that tells me what my guess should be. I should guess e to the t. Let's try that. The derivative of e to the t is e to the t minus three e to the t's. Now, I have negative two e to the t. Well, that is still failure, but it is closer. You know what the problem is? e to the t is a good guess, but I only used one e to the t. I think I used the wrong number of e to the t's. So the proper way to guess is to say, I don't know how many e to the t's I need but I can find out. So if I guess yp of t is a e to the t, and then substitute that in, what's the derivative of that yp of t? It's again, a e to the t is a relatively simple thing to differentiate. And then let's take yp prime, that's dy dt written in the prime notation. Subtract three times copies of yp. What do I get? A e t minus three times a, excuse me, a e t. That's minus two times a e t. What do I get? I get minus two AT. What did I want? I wanted two ET. Well, by comparing those two functions, I say, I now know what A was. A is minus one. And this is where we'll have to wrap it up. So now I have the general solution to this problem. The problem was Y prime minus three Y is two ET y of zero is minus one. The yh was a solution to star. The yp, which I just discovered, I just discovered 
that a is minus one, that yp is minus e minus, uh, minus e to t. I put those together, c e to the three t minus e to the t. And that's my general solution to the problem I was given. Do I want to find out what C was? Now I use the initial condition and say this is minus one. When I plug in T equals zero, T equals zero will give me C times one minus one. And so now I know C is equal to zero. It's kind of unfortunate that it drops out if I add one to both sides, C is zero. Now I know the one and only one solution to this initial value problem. Zero e to the three T minus one e to the T or just simply minus e to the T. The one and only solution to the initial value problem, allow me to abbreviate, dy dt is 3y plus 2e to the t. And we have 0 minus 1. This technique I just demonstrated is called the homogeneous and non-homogeneous technique. Sometimes people call it the yh and yp technique because of the two pieces that you form here. Now we're gonna to have to cut it off today because I've already used our allotted time. But this technique is what you practice in section six, I'm sorry, in section one eight. We're gonna give you two ways to solve linear equations. And then when we're done, I'll show you the other way tomorrow. We'll ask you which one you favor. And it's not a matter of which one you favor. Sometimes you can use both, sometimes you can only use one. So you use what works. But this is one technique. This is called the method of undetermined coefficients because you were kind of trying to guess what that A was. And the method tomorrow in section 1.9 is called the method of the integrating factor. They're both useful, you need both. And I won't tell you, I don't wanna spoil it for you who wins. One of them is a little more useful than the other. Okay, I'll let it be there. I'm gonna be reading your papers, posting answers, getting these videos posted. This is a horrible, horrible machine we've created to get you through this in six weeks. But you don't have many other alternatives. So hang in there, you'll get faster, you'll get quicker, you'll get more insightful as you go along. But this first couple of weeks, this first two weeks in particular, you're gonna to have to move at a hard pace. So make sure you're consuming all the material on our site. Uh, I'm gonna stop the recording. If anybody has a question they wanna ask, like just 